Hello, and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened, where we discuss, explore, and connect with fellow empaths, healers, intuitives, and seekers. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Enlightened Empaths. We hope you're having a beautiful, happy, and joyful week. We're going to be sharing with you all this week some stories and questions and dreams that you all have sent in for us to discuss. So just pour yourself a cup of coffee or tea and pretend that you're sitting around the table with Denise and me. I'm going to start us off, Denise, if that's all right. Oh, that'd be lovely. Thank you. Okay, this one is a great story about how important it is to really listen to and trust your intuition. And our listener writes, I wanted to share a story on the power of intuition and why it is so important to pause and listen to what it's trying to tell you. Last summer, my boys nine and 12 were playing in the neighborhood as they typically do during their downtime. I was working in the garden when I had sudden pressure in my chest and found it hard to breathe. At first I thought I was overexerting myself in the garden. I continued to work in the garden, trying to ignore the pressure in my chest when I realized what this feeling was. This is the feeling I get when I feel something negative is about to happen. I quickly dropped what I was doing and walked over to my boys who were playing with their neighborhood friends. I told them it was time to come inside, to which they whined and complained, but eventually complied. I texted my neighbor, whose children were still playing outside, about why I was taking my boys in and what I was feeling. She called her boys inside after receiving my text. Well, a few hours later, I received a text from that neighbor telling me that a car had sped through their little side street so fast that it sideswiped her truck and then took off right where the kids were playing. Thank you to spirit, divine source, God, guardian angels. They were surely looking out for me, my boys, and the neighborhood kids that day. P.S. Denise, I feel so connected to what you say sometimes that I feel like you're walking through my brain and reading my thoughts. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. But isn't that a beautiful validation of my gut feeling? Spirit was saying, "Okay, you don't feel well. It is a precursor to something coming. Take care of your boys. Go home. This is a beautiful story. It really is. And it shows that when we listen to our intuition and follow its patterns, which often do show up in our body, we might feel a pressure in our chest. We might get a tingling in our ears. We might just get a sense of knowing or a thought might just drop into our head, you know, oh, it's time to tell the boys to come inside. And it can be really difficult sometimes to discern, is this my fear or is this my intuition? But clearly this listener had a pattern of recognizing and paying attention and noting that when she felt this pressure in her chest, it usually was a harbinger of some negative things to come. So just a great reminder to not only listen to your intuition, but to also be observant and pay attention and notice the patterns of how your intuition speaks to you. Right. And we've both been in that place, or maybe I'm speaking out of turn, where I've had that I've had, and I fought through it or I've ignored it, or I said, Oh, I'm making that up. And if you learn to trust it, they will not let you down. Yeah. I I believe that in my soul. I do too. Um, Our next one, I've had three or four medium sessions every two or three years with the same medium via an online video platform. The first few sessions were a positive experience. This medium was able to provide very specific information that even my most skeptical family members gave pause to think that there may be something to this after all. Recently, my maternal grandmother passed away and I thought I should have a session with the medium. By the time my session came around, my estranged biological male parent had died. He was very violent and abusive and I didn't want him at that session. I thought it would be enough to say a prayer that he was not to show up. I thought it would be enough to talk to my ancestors and say anyone who is genuinely loving may come, and I don't want this specific person to show up. I even prayed to his mother, telling her that I would recognize her as a grandmother if she kept him away. She'd come to me years ago in a dream saying, I'm your grandmother too. Shockingly, this wasn't enough to keep me safe. The experience was awful. The medium wanted to spend the whole time with this manipulative spirit who had not changed their cruel ways. 
and I was stuck like a deer in the headlights or more truly like a terrorized child, unable to say stop. I became very unhelpful toward the medium when she eventually did move on to the next spirit as I felt re-traumatized by this male parent spirit in what was supposed to be a safe space. My therapist has been able to help me process the, the event from her training and perspective. Here are my questions for you. How do I prevent this from happening again in a medium session? Do I pray to St. Michael? I have been praying to him every day since this experience. Do I find a medium that perhaps has a stronger ability not to let a certain spirit in or one that's more sensitive toward her clients and what's happening for them? Or do I go back to the same medium and say, under no circumstances is the spirit welcome? I'm hesitant to do this because she started to give advice and her option about forgiveness and overall healing in a way that I thought was not her place to do so. I really don't want this experience to ruin this wonderful connection I've had since I was little with the other side. So your advice would be most appreciated with the caveat that I'm not interested in the idea of forgiveness here or anything that helps this male parent spirit. He doesn't get any more airtime. I'm the one who needs help. I want my connection back with the truly loving spirits and be safe in a future medium session or in my own spiritual work, which I've been very wary of engaging with again. And when I first, and anyone who, who does work as a medium, I think you'd have a similar reaction. When I first read this, I got that twinge of, oh my gosh, did I do this? Did I put someone in that space? And I really follow the, the spiritualist church way of looking at mediumship of do no harm. And what really made me realize it wasn't me, or if, I, if I've ever done this to anyone, my deepest soul apologies, because I would never, ever want anyone to feel that kind of, um, that's not why you go to a medium. No disrespect to the person that she had the reading with. So just the fact that this, the, the medium didn't stop when she said, please don't. That's what I picked up on. Yeah. Right. Usually my default with that is if someone, if I bring someone through and they're like, nope, I don't want them. I say, okay, they're there. I don't give advice on how you're meant to process that or forgiveness. That's your work or that's your work with the person in spirit. But what really jumped out at me was that the, the, the line that said the whole time with this manipulative spirit who had not changed their cruel ways. And that alone, that statement alone speaks volumes to me as a, someone who connects with spirit, that if you're feeling that energy, the only ever other times that I've had someone come forward and someone has said, I don't need to talk to them. I always feel them further away. Like I'll see them in the background or I'll feel them further away. And that's almost like my sign of there's something here that they may not be welcome to this person coming forward. I do think that and even if the person is bulldozing, you can always say, this isn't working for me. You can hang up, you can cut the session. You can say, I'm sorry, this isn't a good connection. You never, ever, and I mean this for anyone listening, you never have to continue a reading that doesn't feel right for you. Whether it's mediumship, tarot, intuition, Akashic records, any of them. Do you agree with that? A hundred percent. I know there is sometimes this ongoing debate of, who does the medium serve, the client or the people in spirit, right? Because if we're the link to both sides, do we have an obligation to bring through the spirits who are trying to communicate? I always feel that my first obligation is to the person in front of me. And if they are clearly saying, no, I don't want to hear from this person. I'm not ready to forgive them. I will never be ready to forgive them. Then what I have always done is I, I always picture like a line of spirits waiting to come through and my guide is like the bouncer, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I always picture my guide just very kindly, but firmly taking that spirit and, and taking them out of the line and away from the reading. Because I just feel so strongly if, if you're coming to, if you come to a medium, that is such a place of vulnerability and trust. And it yes. is such an honor as a medium when anyone says, I'm going to take an hour out of my day and I'm going to be so vulnerable and allow you to connect with this grief or this loss or this love or this hope I'm having to connect with this person again. And, and to have someone else come through that was mean and cruel and malicious and, and apparently hasn't changed. And to say, well, you know, he's trying to come through. So we're just going to let him chatty away and, and you're just going to have to sit there and deal with it. No, that's abusive all over again. 
Mm-hmm. I, I feel very strongly about that. And so, oh, yeah, I agree. I agree. Cut, cut the session off, walk away, end it. Um, and then, you know, completely disconnect your energy. I would be reticent to return to this person unless I had a conversation about, you know, how I felt and how that reading made me feel. Because um, I just, I do think that the majority of people, when they pass on and go through the light, that they do seek that forgiveness for what they have done on earth. But there are some who don't. And there are some mediums who do connect with that in-between range. And no, I just don't think that she should have had to deal with that. And, you know, I would recommend that this listener check out Alice Miller's work because she has written extensively in, in her lifetime of work before she passed about how forgiveness isn't always as healing as people say it is. And that sometimes that shouldn't be your goal, at least not in the beginning. Your goal should not be on forgiving that person. It should be on healing yourself and working on yourself. Right. Right. And, and I do think I'm a big fan of Archangel Michael, big fan. The other thing that, that crossed my mind is if you've gone to the same person, they may know your story. They may know you. They may know. And that, that might change the dynamics of the reading in, in, in boundaries or what you feel it can be through. I work as a channel, so I don't generally ma- remember what comes through from people. I'll remember snippets or I'll remember. But I did a reading yesterday for a woman and I'm describing. And then she smiled. She said, well, you told me that a year ago. And I didn't have any recollection of connecting with this person before. So, and new things came through and it was good. I think if this is someone that you're working with that you feel really connected to, you love their style, you feel like it's been very positive. I I think you're spot on, Samantha, that have the conversation of that wasn't okay. And please, we need stronger boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think when you're a medium, you are nothing more than, than a mailman. Right. And so imagine if you have a package and you have to deliver it to one, two, three main street. And the person says, Oh, I don't want this package as, as the mail person. Are you going to say, Oh no, no, you have to take it. It's been mailed to you. They paid the stamp. You have to take it. No, you're going to be like, all right, I'll return to sender and move on to my next house. We have to be that objective when we're doing readings. Right. And I do, I do honor spirit and the person I'm reading for. Yes. But neither one has a right to be abusive. That was a really poignant way to put that when you said it a few minutes ago. Well, I hope no. this helps that listener because that's not a good experience. No. All right. Our next one says, I had a weird dream last night and would love to hear your take on it. In my dream, I was at a random house and was outside next to a car. But in the reflection in the car window, I wasn't actually me. I was a younger male with kind of long hair. There was yelling and arguing, and then someone tried to take my wallet, and I fell into the front seat of the car, and I actually carry a pistol with me, so I opened the console, but it wasn't in this car. And then I was shot in the chest and stomach multiple times. We drove to a gas station, and I woke up. Well, this morning, I saw on the news they found a young 21-year-old shot to death at that gas station. I saw a picture of the young man, and it's the same reflection that I saw in the window in my dream. It really freaked me out when I saw those pictures. Would love to hear what you ladies think that means. Okay, I believe that this listener is a night worker. And what happens so often when natural intuitives who are also empathic, when we sleep, our body is resting, our mind is resting, but so often our soul is traveling and we are doing healing work. And some of the work that night workers are or soul travelers are called to do is help others cross over successfully into the light. And when we die suddenly, unexpectedly, and tragically, we are in a state of shock, just like you would if you were physically alive, right? Like, you know, if you're in a state of shock, you're kind of out of it and you can't snap to same thing happens to our soul. And what I have experienced in my own dream encounters is that when these souls are knocked out of their body that traumatically and quickly, they are so physically oriented to their body for several moments, sometimes longer, that they can't see the light. They can't see their guides. They can't see their angels. They can't see their loved ones on the other side. And so unless a medium, usually in in this dream state, is present to help guide them to the light and to their team of helpers, 
they could be stuck and stay here for a time as a ghost. And so it, it's my firm belief that there are several people out there who are, you know, maybe unaware of it for most of their life that at night their soul is traveling to do this very important work. And luckily, not only do I have my own experience of being at these scenes in dreams, but there's, there's research. Um, there's a famous story that I believe was first written up in the uh, Journal of um, the American Psychological Society. And a man, his name was William Franklin Prince. He had a dream. He lived in Long Island. He had a dream that a woman came to him and said, I am going to take my life tonight and I need someone to hold my hand and be a witness with me. And he, in this dream, he went with her to the train tracks and was with her holding space while she lay down on the train tracks. I apologize. I know this is all very gruesome. Um, He reported it to the American Psychological Research Society, but they did some research and found out that the exact night of uh, his prince's dream, a woman in Long Island had laid down across the train tracks and and committed suicide in that way. Like, what are the odds? Right. So here's an odd question. If you're working as a night worker, do you dream? Do you think you still dream or do you just go to the other side? The reason I ask that is two people last week that I was working with, they laughed and they said, oh, I had a dream about you last night and you were in my dream and you were doing this and this. And and it's always so weird to think you're in somebody else's dream. But then I started thinking, I, that was when I I've shared this with you before, I have these stretches where I don't dream at all. And then I have patches of really vivid dreams and I hadn't been dreaming. So would I, what do you think? So here's what I think our mind has to do what I call like a brain dump, right? Like we have to have those dreams where we just kind of dump our stress. And I think those Mm -hmm. are just traditional, normal dreams that can be amazingly illuminating for our conscious awareness. But I also believe that those of us who are called to this work, sometimes I'm not saying that this listener every single night is witnessing someone's traumatic death and crossing them over. No. But I do think that there are many, many nights where you will be called to do this. And it's not always this. Sometimes it could be giving a reading. Sometimes it could be holding space for a soul to have a transference of healing energy. Sometimes it could be you just consulting and and kind of going over your soul plan with your guides. There's all sorts of different soul travel experiences that we have, but I do not think we have them seven nights a week. No. No, I, I agree. And I do think those times when we don't remember our dreams, it could be that you're active and showing up in other people's dreams, and that's why you don't remember them. Um, It could also just be, I've noticed for me personally, this is why keeping a dream journal is so important so you can recognize patterns. But if I'm very stressed out or I'm really tired and I go to bed tired and I wake up tired, that type of tired, I will not remember my dreams. Oh, that makes sense. So I I think there's different reasons. And, and, you know, the whole dream world, we'll talk about it more over the summer, but it's so complex, you know, because it's, it's not just dreaming and it's not just soul traveling and it's not just astral projection or, or lucid dreaming. There's, there's so many layers to it, but I truly believe that this listener was holding space with him so that this soul could recognize, yes, I was shot. I was driven to this gas station where I died, and now it's time for me to go into this light. That's a sacred place to hold for someone. Yes. Yes, it is. Our next one, about five years ago, I graduated as a nurse practitioner. It was a big achievement, and I really valued my profession and hard work. Shortly after finishing the program, I became a mother to my wonderful daughter. She was a very challenging baby, crying constantly, always wanted to be held, and never would take a bottle, only nursing. To make things more challenging, my husband works in a foreign country, and I was living in a rural, isolated community in northern Canada, away from all support systems. In short, it didn't take us long to move back to my hometown on the East Coast. I had hopes of finding work as a nurse practitioner, and we were planning to build a house. Well, the pandemic hit, and I just couldn't find work. It was odd, though, because I intuitively felt like I was not meant to work in this role anymore. 
I struggled emotionally and mentally for a while as I've always identified myself with my profession. Last August, I decided to try Reiki. The night before my Reiki treatment, I had this very vivid, almost lucid type of dream where I visualized bolts of energy or lightning out of my hands. I even woke up with a cracking noise as if one of the bolts hit the door to my closet. The next day during my treatment, I experienced many sensations, but perhaps the most interesting was the feeling of my hands and arms floating out of my body. I went home feeling good and decided to meditate. During my meditation, I thought to myself, I'm giving everything up to the universe. It's up to the universe. Four years later, I received an offer letter for a full-time term employment opportunity, which fit my lifestyle perfectly at the time. After this, I started receiving intuitive hits, but not overly positive ones. I had a feeling one night that I needed to get up and lock my car. A few days later, my car was stolen. Then a few weeks later, I looked up at the trees around my house, house and thought, I really don't have a good feeling about those trees. One of our tallest trees toppled over during a storm the next day. I'm learning to listen to these little hits of, of intuition, but sometimes I confuse them with fears. One night while lying in bed, I asked my spirit guide to tell me their name. To my shock, I heard Peter Ray Child. One night prior to falling asleep, I asked to meet my spiritual guide in a fun, lighthearted hearted manner. I had the most wonderful dream where I met a very artsy woman, along with her with three other people, a tall, slender man, a woman who appeared to be in her 30s, and a female child about the age of seven to nine years old with dark brown hair. Could this be Peter, Ray, and child? I've decided to sign up for Reiki training this coming May. I'm feeling called to do so. I also have a feeling I'm meant to be an entrepreneur, but really have no idea in what. I'm just going with the flow and letting the universe guide me, but some days I just want things to hurry along. I'm hoping you receive this email and can let me know what your thoughts are on these experiences. I'd love to know what I can do to build my intuition and expand my spiritual journey. That is the perfect example of, you know, that balance between linear, you know, to, to become a nurse practitioner, which congratulations, that is a very rigorous program and a, a huge commitment. And also to be awakened into the intuitive side and what it feels like is spirit is giving her this beautiful insight and validation to say, maybe you want to blend those two together with what you're working towards next because we both know whether it's as an intuitive or a medium or a healer, spirit is gonna use whatever your, your personal blueprint of energy, your expertise, your experience, your memory. So that whatever she chooses to do, this person chooses to do, will they're going to use all of these resources that she's built up over this time. And I do love that Peter Ray and child sure feels pretty spot on. Oh, it surely does. And I think if she's wanting to shift and more of her career into more of an entrepreneurial way, that's not going to happen overnight, but that will happen. And so the more she follows these intuitive nudges of continuing her Reiki training and reaching out to her spiritual team in meditation and dreams, the more illuminated her path to entrepreneurship will become. It happens for most of us, I think slowly, right? Like if, if someone told you, Denise, you're going to leave teaching and be an entrepreneur, wouldn't you years ago have been like, no, I know that's what I would have said. And yet here we are entrepreneurs, but mm -hmm. it, it didn't happen overnight. No, it happened by following spirits, guidance and, and call and our own inner knowing, you know, our own inner insight. You never, never, ever, ever neglect listening to your inner self. And I know she said like some of her intuitive things are, are negative. That's so common in the beginning as you're learning to understand how your intuition works. Remember our first listener who got the pain in her chest and thought mm -hmm. she was just hitting the garden too hard and then remembered, oh, that's kind of my symbol for negative things. And so very often it's the negative stuff that hits us first because it's got the heaviest energy. So it's easiest but the more you train your intuition and heighten your sensitivity, the more easily you'll start to recognize the good signs that good things are heading your way as well. And sometimes you might have to ask for them. 
you know, like for me, do you know what? I have the weirdest sign for negative stuff coming up. You know, like when you're trying to fall asleep and you see like weird images flash before your, your, your closed eyelids during that Uh hypnagogic state. Okay. If I'm going to have a not so great day the next day, I see the clown from it. Oh yeah. It's terrifying. And it took me a long time to track that and figure that out that the, Oh, that's what that means. And I realized a couple of weeks after I figured that out, I don't have a little nice image for, Oh, Smith, you're going to have a happy day tomorrow. And so I was like, son of a bitch guides. Hello. I need a sign (laughs) for happy stuff. And so I'm just driving around as I'm always doing, I feel. And I was just kind of ranting at them in my head and a bluebird flew across my, my car. And Mm -hmm. so I said, okay, so if I see a bluebird, that's my sign that good things are going to happen the next day. And so now, so you can, my point is we can always be co-creators with our spiritual team. I don't want people to ever just follow these, uh, these signs, you know, because sometimes that can lead you in the wrong direction. You have to ask for signs. You have to create signs, but you also have to listen to your own inner knowing inner knowing. It's a conversation that we have to have. And what I love is the bluebird of happiness. Yeah. So you're working with a team that has a good sense of humor too. Yeah. I think they do sometimes. Usually, usually they just sound like RuPaul. Girl, you got to (laughs) work. Sometimes they have a sense of humor. Okay. Our next one says, I've been listening to the two-part podcast on trauma. And before that, the one was Robert Moss talking about dreams. My question is this. I'm 49 years old. My adult life is safe. I have a loving husband, and three kids. I have a good, strong relationships with all of them. Our home, I believe, is happy and a loving environment. Not perfect by any means. Don't get me wrong. We all have our faults. Anyway, what I'm trying to get at is that I have a good life. As a child, however, I suffered a significant amount of emotional trauma. I grew up in a violent and alcoholic home. At school, I was bullied severely by my peers from kindergarten up through and including most of high school. I've tried to move beyond that, and I think I have been successfully able to do that in some ways. But in other ways, I feel like all that old pain is just right under the surface. I'm a very empathic person, and I'm a nurse by profession. I'd like to be an intuitive healer, and I think I have the ability to be, but something keeps drawing me to that. But at the same time, I feel like I'm the least intuitive person out there. I can't seem to remember a dream to save my life. I used to have a recurring dream of being chased by an attacker in the night through my neighborhood as a child, and I believe the attacker in the dream was my father. I was never physically abused as a child, but there was a lot of violence in my house directed at my mother from my father and, of course, the emotional abuse. I really resonated with the therapeutic touch class I took while in nursing school. And I really resonate with working as a hospice nurse, which is not the type of nursing I'm doing now, but was exposed to years ago at the beginning of my career. I've tried to lay my hands on pets that have been sick in an effort to bring healing light energy into them to heal them, but they ended up succumbing to their illness. So I don't seem to be able to help in that way as much as I have the desire to. I just feel like I'm someone who really desires to and believes in spiritual connection and healing and yet seem to have no innate ability. I talk to my spirit guides and ask them to reveal themselves to me so I can know them, but nothing happens. I want to know them and I want to communicate with and work them with them, but it doesn't seem that I'm able to receive. I'm hoping you can offer me your insight and guidance. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. I think when we are growing up with that trauma and violence in our home. It does several things, but two, I want to highlight for her question. One, it does turn on your intuition. I firmly believe that. I don't think I would be psychic at all if I didn't have an emotionally abusive mother. And, you know, growing up, I had to always be able to tune into her ever-changing moods so that, you know, we could keep the peace and keep calm in the home. And I think that turned on my intuition. I also think that for most of us, when we're raised in difficult homes, it turns on our empathy, especially if you're bullied or picked on at school, you don't ever want to see that happen to other people. So there are gifts that come out of this darkness, which I think is wonderful. But the other thing that comes when we're raised in a traumatic home, we lose our ability to naturally trust people. 
And often this is a really bad two-way street because sometimes we lose our ability to trust ourselves. Now, if you grew up in an emotionally abusive home, that usually includes gaslighting. That usually, especially, I don't want to speak for this listener, but my father was an alcoholic and I know in our family, we couldn't talk about it, right? You just didn't talk about it. You just went a lot about your day. Like there was nothing wrong with dad drinking. There was nothing wrong with finding, you know, two quarts of empty vodka bottles in the back seat. We just didn't talk about it. And I hated that as a kid. I resisted that. I fought it all the time. I was the only one in my family that would fight that. And everyone was like, what? What's, what's what everyone drinks? Everyone has a wet bar in their house. What are you talking about? When you are raised with that type of thinking, this is normal. Don't talk about it. Don't think about it. Don't look at it. It makes you repress and suppress your truth, your inner knowing, your ability to trust yourself, to trust your eyes and your ears and what you're hearing and seeing and feeling and sensing. And so I feel that this listener is innately intuitive and healer. Look at how her guides are trying so hard to show her that she has this beautiful healing ability. She's been exposed to therapeutic touch, which I think is the most amazing form of healing. I I love that, that whole modality. She's been exposed to hospice work. She's a nurse. I feel like everything around her is shouting, you're a healer. And yet let's look at what she says in her email when she says, I feel like the old pain is just right under the surface. I mean, raise your hand if you can resonate with that, right? Did I share with you guys, Denise, when um, I was pushing my dad in the wheelchair and his his legs slipped out of the, the holder and he the wheelchair went over his foot? Yes. And yes. my first reaction was, oh, I'm in trouble. And I was Aww. like, what? Where did that come from? I am you know, a full on adult. And yet right under the surface, I went right back to being that little girl of, oh no, I'm in trouble now. So I completely understand what she means when she says that old pain is just right under the surface. And what I think she needs to do before she deals with being a healer, before she tries to connect with her dreams, before she tries to connect with her intuition is to really work on healing that inner trauma and doing some inner child work and and really focusing on self-love because she's not remembering her dreams because the child in her that's trying to protect her is saying, no, no, no. Every time we dream, we've got a scary, you know, faceless person trying to attack us. So we're not going to remember that. And you can, it's, I feel like all the answers are in her email. Do you know what I mean? I agree. I agree. And very well, very well stated. Uh, And I, another variable to throw into the mix is that it seems for a lot of people right now, there's a lot of old stuff from the past coming up that needs to be released, that needs to be relinquished. And we're, we're purging that with this transition where we're all in on a personal level and a collective level. And I think that her, I think she's very, very much a natural healer. And it goes back to what I said earlier in, a, in response to a different question is spirit will use what you have and you are a healer. And it's a matter of just be open. If you can figure out, let me get out of the way and let this come through me, not from me, you're going to be pretty amazed with what spirit is capable of doing. Yes. But I think first she's got to work on this inner stuff. And so, oh yeah, I would would recommend it out of the way. Yeah. Like some somatic healing modalities, maybe a monthly massage or joining a Reiki share. Or if I know at my hospital, which like, The hospital in my town isn't like, you know, oh, super advanced, but even we have a healer circle of of nurses who volunteer their time. And so maybe joining a healer circle, really trying to get all that, all that amazing love you're trying to share with others. Please understand, please hear this the way I intend it. Share it with yourself first. And I don't mean that selfishly. I mean that in a healing way, you know, so allow yourself to get healings. Allow yourself to get the love and the intuition that you're seeking to give to others. Allow yourself to receive it first. Check out John Bradshaw's work on inner child work. Um, read Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Bruce Perry's recent book, uh, What Happened to You, or you know, The Body Keeps Score, The Body Never Lies. Try EEMDR therapy to release some of that trauma that's, yes, way in the past, but right below the surface. And once you do that and start to trust and love yourself, 
it's like a banana. It's all going to peel away. And the true light worker that you are is going to be shining just as it is right now. Oh, that's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I, I hope it helps. Yeah, that was very nice. Our next one says, my mom and I have a story to share that involves our cat who passed away in 2016. We make time to speak to our loved ones that have passed once a week with a talking board. We've also been to mediums as well. We've received nothing but incredible validations and love from both mediums and our talking board. In October 2016, our wonderful cat, Stubby, passed away at 20 years old. He died peacefully in the house with us by his side. We knew it was coming, but regardless, it was still awful. He was a joyful, beautiful black cat, communicative, full of love for people, despised other animals, especially cats, and he had his own little routine that he followed every day. He was part of everything, and his favorite thing that he enjoyed was patrolling the neighborhood, hanging out with us in the front yard, and getting his massage every night after dinner. He wouldn't go to sleep without it. Immediately, he came through on the talking board after his death. He came through to a medium, and she mentioned that he notices things that most cats don't notice or care about. In 2019, Stubby told me he was going to give me a rose to, to prove what he can do and to really prove that we were talking to him. He said this a couple of times during our sessions. I said, okay, that sounds nice. A couple of months later, I went on a trip to Italy with my parents. When we arrived in Rome, we saw a lot of solicitors pushing to sell roses to people. We saw dead roses that people had bought and tossed lying around on the Spanish steps. We joked and said, oh, look, here's your rose. One night we were walking around looking for a restaurant. The streets were empty and we got lost. We ended up in some desolate Piazza place off the beaten path. Out of nowhere, one of the street solicitors urgently came at us with his arm extended, holding two roses. He said, please take these. I don't want any money for them. Just take them. At first we said no, because we didn't feel like carrying them around, but he pushed them on and was about to walk away. But my father would, wouldn't let him go without giving him some money. The man told us he didn't want any, but my father insisted he take five euros. The man begrudgingly took it and walked away. We said to each other, I guess these roses are from Stubby. The next day we had a tour book for the Coliseum. We were outside waiting with a group of people. I know this is going to sound very strange. As we started to walk with the tour, five euros fell to my mom's feet. We checked to make sure nothing had fallen, fallen out of our pockets. My mother picked up the money and asked everybody touring around with us, did anybody lose this? Everyone shook their heads. One of the people said, you keep it. We won't tell. I said to my parents, do you, do you know what this is? This must be Stubby returning money for the roses because we weren't supposed to pay for them. So that's a story. It makes me wonder, how is physical manifestation possible? And also, why would spiritual reception be better to work within some places and not others? We love you guys and so happy the podcast. Say hi to Deb too. Hi, Deb. Uh, well, I love this story because, and I've talked to other people that communicate with animals, and some of us connect with animals like they're sentient beings. They have their own personality. They have their own little soul. And I'm, that you may get pictures, you may get images, you may feel like you're having a conversation, but you are communicating. They can communicate with us too. And I believe that. And I know it to be true in my world. I think it's funny about the roses. And I'm wondering, is a talking board a Ouija board? Yes. Or Okay. That's what I'm thinking. I don't know how they manifest things physically. I don't know how we find the dimes or how we, uh, the lights go on and off or that there's a feather on your pillow or it fascinates me to no end. Absolutely. Because it, we can go into the, oh, everything's energy, has frequency, blah, 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 blah. Imagine what it takes to move that when you don't have a physical form and how does it just show up? So I don't have a clear answer for that, but it intrigues me to no end. Because the, over the years, when I've experienced what other people have shared with us, it is phenomenal what spirit, what those in spirit can bring through for us. And why it's better in some places than others, I, again, have to go back to frequency of, you know, is there a vortex? Is it a holy place? Is it, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, about that feeling of sitting in the back of a church, how different it is when you and I were speaking before we recorded. Mm -hmm. And uh, certain places that you might be walking in nature and you'll stop and you'll feel 
so connected to all that is, I do think that there's a difference with, with the vibration of certain places on the planet. Sure. I mean, we could go into a whole show on ley lines. Mm-hmm. And, you That'd know, how certain, yeah, some people think like there's so many UFO sightings and ghost things around the San Luis Valley because the mountain there is quartz. So it could be connected to the minerals there. It could be the ley lines, the energy. It could be that you were on vacation and so relaxed that your energy was finally quiet enough to receive this gift. You know, sometimes I think we're so busy and running around and doing this and doing that and checking this off and going here and setting our alarm that we miss a lot of these signs from spirit. So it could be place, but it could also be that your family was just happy and traveling and in this wonderful historic country and just feeling very stress-free. That could be part of it. As to how they do this, I agree with Denise. I don't think we really know. We have some inklings. Like I think about the mediums who can do apports. Um, there's some famous ones in India who can just make things appear out of nowhere. And I love studying that and reading about that. And I haven't witnessed it for myself, but I would, I would love to. I have had a crystal just appear on my bedside table that I know I did not buy and no one in my family bought. It just appeared and it was a crystal I had been searching for for months. So I've had an experience that way with an apport, but I've read, haven't you read those, those accounts, Denise, of, of people who sit around a medium and they'll focus on apporting an object like a watch or something. And then the watch will just drop from nowhere. Yes. I've never witnessed it, but I've heard of it. Yes. Yeah. I've never witnessed it either. You can also research the, the skull experiments. I think it's spelled S C U L L in England. And it was just a, a group of people who met religiously every week and connected with spirit and They did a documentary on them that's streaming either Amazon or Netflix. I can't remember, but you can watch it. And they had a ports and spirit photography and all sorts of cool things. But I also think like, you know how they've been able to prove scientifically that if you stare at someone's back long enough, you can feel it and you'll turn around and see them looking at you. Right. Right. I wonder if going on that same line, if spirits in heaven are able to take their focused, concentrated thought and drop it into someone's head. So in the same way that, that physically we can feel someone staring at us, I wonder if spiritually they can drop thoughts into people's heads, people who are open, you know, more imaginative and intuitive and open. And so maybe this man selling roses was just open and Stubby was able to drop a thought in go give these two roses to these, to these two lovely ladies and don't charge them. It, it makes sense. Yeah. I don't know. And, and, you know, you've just made a really good point. Is it along the lines of when someone will manifest and they'll say, Oh, I had a dream about this house. I can see every detail of it that I know that's my house. And then lo and behold, they buy a house and it's exactly the one that they manifested, dreamt about, had a precognition feeling about. Mm -hmm. So if we go into that whole, this is a little off track, but not entirely, we go into, if it's all an illusion and we can do, we can manifest what we need to bring into our lives, which, I mean, we've both seen that, oh, I need a vehicle. It needs to be this. It needs to be that. And then poof, there it shows up. Is it because you're concentrating your energy on finding that or because there's some kind of a, I I don't know. I, I think it's fun to think about stuff like that. I am so good at doing that with tiny, insignificant things. And I'm not good at doing that with big things like cars. Like I was, I needed a certain fabric. I have to get this bench seat recovered and I could not find the fabric that would match everything else. And I was like, I just, this is what I need it to look like. And this is the color I need it to be. And I just need to find this because I don't have time. And I went to the second store and it was the exact fabric I needed. (laughs) My, my kids joke, every time I go to Target, there's this one super close spot to the front door. It's always waiting for me. It's weird. It's always empty, no matter what time I go. (laughs) But have I learned and mastered how to visualize a house? And no, I need to work on that. Have you been able to visualize and manifest something big like that? Uh, For other people, but not so much for myself, which is weird. So, yeah, yeah. We need, we need to work on that. <laughs> yes, we do. 
<laughs> okay. Our next one says, I am needing guidance on how to connect with my spirit guides. I've been in the horse industry my entire life. I grew up showing horses, became a professional horse trainer, then a riding coach, and had the opportunity to run a boarding facility. At the time, I felt it was an opportunity not to be passed up and was excited. Two years in, a rough marriage, low finances, and low morale later, we were offered an even more incredible opportunity, and a wonderful human being offered to help us purchase our own facility. At the time, I was excited and looking forward to this new chapter. We are two years into our current situation, and I have my dream horse, my marriage is fantastic, and I'm still miserable. I went through a slew of horrible clients that contributed to anxiety I didn't have before, and I've had some of the coolest horses I've ever seen. My current clients are fantastic, so positive, and have great energy. However, I'm finding myself wanting to shift away from my comfort zone as the passion seems to be dwindling. Water has always been sort of a sign for me when people are getting ready to leave or move. We've had pipes or waters burst, and shortly after, someone has given notice they are leaving. But here, it seems to be me. My bathtub flooded in my bathroom. Our pipes burst under the house. The toilet was running constantly for about a month, and sometimes the pipes freeze going to our house. I also have had a series of probably 15 random and weird things just break in genuinely odd circumstances the past few weeks. I ended up saging and cleansing my house. This property has had some strange things happen. Last summer, a series of five horses all broke their legs in different ways. One had to be put down. Four were able to recover. The word hobgoblin kept coming up in conversation. And there was also a dark energy that we released as well as an older lady that did not like me being there. None of this strange stuff was happening to or around me before we got to this property other than the water. Is there a cleansing ritual I should do for the entire property? How do you see water as a sign and how can I read that more clearly? Wow. Okay. So the fact that the word hobgoblin kept coming up in conversation, Denise, makes me feel that there may be an elemental attached to this property. Okay. What do you think? Have you, I, I was doing a reading years ago for this woman and I just saw this, I don't even know how to describe it in words. I just saw this thing that did not look human and I knew it owned her property or at least it believed it did. And it was just a traditional reading, you know, she wanted to focus on career. And I, I did that. And then at the end I said, Hey, don't, don't, don't get nervous or, or freaked out because I get stuff wrong all the time. But if you had anything weird happen in your house in the last couple of months, and it was like a dam breaking, she was like, yes, I, I think there's a ghost. There's this, this, this. And I said, no, I, I think it's an elemental. And I, I didn't even know what I meant. Do you ever do that in a reading where stuff comes out? Yes. Yeah. So I, I've never forgotten that reading. I really wasn't able to help her. I've researched elementals. I still don't know what to do about them or what they are. Uh, some people call them fairies. Some people call them goblins. Some people call them, uh, you know, pre-human. Th- I, I don't know what they are, but there are cases where there are these non-human entities oh please do not like send me off to an institution for saying this on the air no i know how crazy it sounds but if i didn't have that it doesn't though it it doesn't sound crazy because there are many realms that we're not aware of and that there are many realms we are aware of and there are a lot of different uh the elementals at the you know when people have these if you go back in folklore if you go back in the stories of of different parts of the world, all parts of the world have these stories that talked about the fairies and the goblins and the elves and the the hobgoblins and all of those things were, if you, they're all documented in, and they're considered fairy tales or stories or this or that, but were they, or were people just more open to their presence? Because if you do any kind of journey work, you can go and meet creatures or the elementals of that are connected with the nature spirits or how so many people are connected with the fairy world you know that is a huge oh the fae and the and how different would that be than in, in a weird sort of way but not really connecting with the energies of the crystals which are also of the earth and are kind of an elemental energy as well 
Very true. Good, good points. You know, I had a, I had something weird happen just last week. I was hosting Easter at my house. So of course I had to clean like a crazy person. And after my house was cleaned, I was like, Oh, my yard's a mess. So I'm cleaning my yard and, and I'm out there raking leaves and all this stuff. And a neighbor walked by and, and she was with her kid and, and she said, your fairy tree isn't the same. Have I talked about my fairy tree, Denise, on this show? I don't think so. Oh, okay. So when my kids were little, 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 they were super into fairies. And so we have this big tree on the side of the house and I decided to call it our fairy tree. And I bought like little fairy houses and little paths and it was this whole big thing. And I had little like um, iron fairies, you know, that would sit around the tree and there were bridges and a wishing well, you know, a little village. Mm -hmm. And um, all the neighborhood kids would come and visit it from time to time. And there was a little mailbox so people could leave notes for the fairies. And weird stuff happened around that fairy tree. Like plants grew around there that I never planted. That that whole tree is covered in ivy and moss now that I did not plant. A peanut plant grew there. A lily grew there. Tulips grew there. And we would find crystals there. And, you know, I never knew it was the neighborhood kids dropping that off. I don't know. It was, but it was just strange. Neat little stuff would happen all around that. Well, the kids got older and I kept the fairy tree up as long as I could, but eventually, you know, just kind of left it to go. And so the, the paint has faded off the little village, the bridge broke, the little swing set broke. And so when the neighbor commented on that, I felt kind of bad, you know, so I cleaned up the whole fairy tree. I took all the houses into the garage and um, started painting them. I haven't finished. And I, I bring it all into the garage. I finish, you know, clearing it all out, making room. I water the moss and the ivy and the tree and all the little plants that have grown up around it. It's all clean. I, the little pathway is all pristine again. And I have one like conch shell there and an open shell. And uh, I go to put the hose up and in that huge open shell, is one of the iron fairies just sitting there. Oh my. And like, we, we thought that, that the neighborhood kids or someone had just taken all the, like those iron fairies have been lost forever. Mm -hmm. They weren't buried. Like they, I just thought someone took them and, you know, to each his own, I don't care, but I have not seen that fairy in, I got that. It's gotta be 10 years since I've seen that iron fairy. And there she was. And I thought that was so weird. So of course I left her there, but I told my kids about it and they were like, Oh, it was probably in the, all the leaves. Well, I'm not a mess. I, I do <laughs> rake the leaves every year, you know? So like, it's not like they were sitting there for 10 years. So anyway, um, two days later, I go out to water that whole area. And in the conch shell is a hematite ring. Oh, and I was like, what? So I bring that in. And my, we have a teenage boy that lives next door. And one of my kids is like, oh, all the, all the boys at, at school are wearing those rings now. He probably dropped it. And I'm like, but he's the other side of that house. And how would it drop and land in the conch shell? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I do think that if this listener is dealing with something that has an elemental nature, I've never read about, researched, or experienced a way to cleanse them of that property. I, I think, and I don't know, so, you know, take this with a, with a big bucket of salt, but I think one way is to try to coexist. And so maybe yes. you could create a place on your property, like a fairy tree, where you could, I don't mean like leave offerings. It's, that's so hard for me, you know, like as a Christian to be like, oh, here, leave offerings. And so, I don't know what that means, but but create a place that's kind of like, okay, we're going to coexist together. And, you know, please, I respect and love the land, but I also respect and love my horses. And if we're going to coexist here, I just ask that you love and respect these beautiful horses and the land too. And let's try to make this work. And that was another thing that really troubled me. And the whole thing was to have five horses break their legs in different ways in a summer. That's that's weird. That, yeah. And that's heartbreaking. And water yeah. is a conductor of energy. And often when you have like we, my family and I growing up, we lived in a haunted house for seven years. And I can't tell you how many plumbers my mom called in to fix the running toilet. It 
they never could figure it out. And so I've read in other books that that's often a sign of some stuff going, you know, sometimes it's a sign you need a new toilet. Sometimes it's, it's an indication of something going on in the property. Right. And water is connected with emotions Mm -hmm. and fluidity and flow and, and all of those things, but very interesting story. And I mean, it could be contributing to her mood because she's like, I have this fantastic career. I have this lovely marriage. I've got wonderful clients and I'm still feeling miserable. And so I wonder if it's connected to this energy that's, you know, maybe in, a, in another dimension screaming, get out. Yes. Yes. But it, it well, I think there's a, it, it would be worth researching a little bit and reading up on and coming up with some solutions about, with what feels right for, for this person. But spot on with setting the boundaries and saying, we can try to do this together or I mean, you can have come, people come in and clear your land and, and lead these folks away, these, these energies, but uh, that's a really Okay, yes, but I'm a, big, I'm a big believer in doing that yourself. Oh, I agree. Right, in, yeah. In however it's humanly possible or, so a lot of times when people will ask, oh, can you come clear my house? Can you come do this? I, I prefer to show people how to do that. Rather exactly. Than, because then you, you have the skill. And it, I think it has more strength if it's your property, your home, your, your energy to clear it out. I think it's stronger, but I don't know if there's anything to, to back that up or not. But if you just like created a little garden area where you grew wild things and just let it be and just say like, you know, this is just a way of me trying to make peace with the land that could yeah. help. Right. And it, and it just seems like get back to the dream and reclaim that because it sounds like it's an incredible life. I agree. Okay. Well, we probably should finish up because we've got a bunch more. Yes, we have so many more. Yeah, we'll, ha- we'll definitely. Good. Yeah, that is good. We've got some great ones that we haven't gotten to, but we are at a time. But we will get, we will get to all of these. We do read all of your emails and messages, and um, eventually we do get to all of them. I I promise you that we will do our best to get back to these um, in our May community connections. And we thank you guys so much for taking time to email us and share us your stories and dreams and questions. Remember if you're listening and you're like, Oh, I want to respond to that or share a question or story. You can always email us enlightened empaths at gmail.com, or you can message us on Facebook, just search enlightened empaths and our page will come up. We appreciate you guys so much. Please remember as always to show up, do great work and share your light. Take care.